Sharon's a published author. She's written about her experiences and is an MDiv student, and you're about second year? Um, since uh, Doug is going to really outline so many of the belief systems of the New Age and people who bring in and syncretize their worldview, what I thought I could really contribute most would be the power behind it, and that being, of course, Satan. Um, I want to start early in my life because <clears throat> when I was a very young girl, um, I would see spirits with my mind. I would see them, and I had three different fantasy playmates, although I knew that they were real, because I would talk with them. And you'll find that many people who eventually become mediums have seen spirits when they're a girl. And it's much different than being like with fantasy playmates. Maybe some of you know of people who have had fantasy playmates as a child. Not everyone who has a fantasy playmate is seeing demons, but in my case, I was seeing uh, actual spirits. And when I would play, I would actually play with my spirit friends more than I would play with other people. And then when I was about five, um, maybe four or five, one of them was run over by a car, and I remember seeing it because I had told him not to go out and play with it in, in the street, you know but he was run over by a car, and then eventually the other two left. And it was around that same time that my parents began attending the Presbyterian Church. And so that place in my mind and my heart that I had communicated so intimately with spirit beings now was replaced with Jesus. And I would talk to Jesus, and I would pray to Jesus, and he was like my very best friend. But my family struggled with many different kinds of problems, and by the time that I was a teenager, um, I had become very mistrustful of adults. My parents, when I was 10, left um, to travel on the road, the both of them together, and I would see them maybe once or twice a weekend, uh, a month, for two weekends a month. And then when they did come home, it was like a big event, but then they would leave, and I was raised by housekeepers. And I remember the day that I really rejected the church and rejected Christianity. I was in a Presbyterian church in Fremont, Nebraska, and it was 1960, or a little earlier, 58. And um, I was sitting by myself on the aisle, and some gypsies were coming into our church. And in Fremont, Nebraska, we never saw gypsies. And so when they were coming into our church, they were looking very poor, and they kind of just poured into the sanctuary, and people were whispering, gypsies, gypsies. And they had their hands out saying, baptize, baptize us. And our Presbyterian pastor was reading his notes, you know, so he was going on with his sermon he looked over his glasses and saw this group of people coming in and he just like went like that you know like pushing them out of the sanctuary well 16 year old was horrified like I in my mind I was screaming hypocrites why what about feeding the poor and they had had their hands outstretched asking for their babies to be baptized and so in my mind the church wasn't what it said it was and neither was my parents, they weren't who they said they were, and the minister wasn't. And then that said, in my mind, was God who he said he was? My answer was no. Of course, then I had nowhere to put my faith um, but myself. And so I became very accomplished at school and various things. Now I want to clear that up because later um, when I was talking with missionaries from Yugoslavia, they worked with a lot of gypsies, and gypsies will go to as many um, churches as possible to get their children baptized, and they treat it more as a good luck charm, thinking that the more times they get baptized, the better their fortune. And so our, our minister was actually correct in not letting those gypsies disrupt our service, but I was seen through the eyes of a heart that had been broken and a heart that was already hardening towards God. 
But where could I put my faith? And it was 1964 when I moved out to Denver, Colorado, out of college. And I started working at Fort Logan Mental Health Center. And this was the time when the human potential movement was becoming full-blown, or at least in the fringes it was becoming full-blown. And I was in 1965 in a workshop with Virginia Satir, who was saying that we are basically very, very beautiful people on the inside. That if we just learn to heal and reconcile some of the conflicts we have with our past and our family, that we could become the beautiful people that God created. Well, this was like music to my ears, that I wasn't evil or that I wasn't a sinner, that I was basically a good person. In fact, I wanted to be, to be healed. I wanted to resolve every conflict that I had had from my childhood or the way that I was raised. And so I took it very seriously. And I um, studied and became one of the leaders in the human potential movement and conducting workshops throughout the United States. But when I got to my 30s and I had reached many of my personal goals and I was able to communicate, I was able to understand my past, I was able to understand people, I still had this sense inside of me that something was wrong, that there was this uneasiness inside and so in my mind I figured that it was spiritual that this was a spiritual problem certainly couldn't be solved through relationships and because I didn't believe that Christianity had any supernaturalism to it I thought it was just rules and regulations I turned to in the 70s what they call alternative spiritual practices and I started reading as many books as I could on uh, the new age but Then it was called alternative spiritual practices. The New Age wasn't a term that I was familiar with. The group of books that I settled on were the Seth books written by Jane Roberts. And she was a a channeler and a medium who had contacted uh, an entity who then wrote many, many books. And I read most of them. And I found them fascinating. And because she had first been introduced to the spiritual realm through the Ouija board, I went out to a toy store and bought a Ouija board. And then I brought it home and I had a friend come over with me and we sat there and watched that little thing go all over the board, spelling out who the entity was that was trying to make contact and we would ask it questions and then it would answer. So this, in my mind, confirmed that there was a spiritual reality, that the supernatural did exist. And from the books I was reading that whereas in the human potential movement, I was basically a good person who, was, who would evolve or become all that God created me to be if I would resolve conflicts. Now I was reading that there was a spiritual realm right alongside ours that if I would attune my consciousness to it, that then I would become who I was really meant to be, a child of the universe. And I won't go into all of what I accepted because... You've already heard it, what I accepted. I I wanted a laboratory to explore all of this. And my purpose in going to the spiritualist church was to um, find a laboratory where I could kind of figure out what this spiritual realm was about. And so in 1977, I started meditating with a spiritualist group. And I would meditate with them for eight years. And through that group, I learned how to become a medium and a channeler. I conducted an individual psychotherapy, marriage and family psychotherapy practice. uh, And then I would do this on the side, like I would give readings. And I channeled five spirits. Um, The readings were, I thought, helpful to people. It was my way of helping people know what to do with their life or to understand what conflict they were struggling with, many, many different ways. The spirits would impress images on my mind. I would interpret these images or they would talk to me. I heard audible voices. Sometimes they would give me physical sensations. Other times they would just speak mind to mind, thought to thought. I thought that I controlled when they came and went and their messages that they gave were quite uplifting. Um, 
of course, now I understand that they were nonsense, but then I thought they were very wise, the sayings and the messages. Sometimes they came true, the messages I gave. Sometimes they didn't. Uh, that didn't concern me because I thought that it was impossible to really know the future with 100% accuracy. Through these eight years, I studied with Native American shamans, a shaman from a Wichel tribe in Mexico and another from a Lakota Sioux tribe here. Um, the drumming is interesting. I tied water drums with these shamans and did sweat lodges. And the drum actually was going a little bit fast. You have to go really slow because what are we picking up? We're picking up the primordial kind of energy of the earth. We're trying to get into the energy of earth, mother earth. And each of the elements, of course, has a different kind of energy that if you would meditate on it, then your consciousness would become one with it. And it was like how to become one with the universe. I practiced the Tarot, the I Ching, many different divinations. Why did I stop? I discovered that my inner life was deteriorating. I was becoming less of who I knew myself to be. I was becoming more fragile. My heart was cold. I was not able to connect with people anymore. If I would be talking with someone, uh, like connecting with a human being, they would be chattering in my mind at the same time or giving me an image. So I was living in two worlds and I couldn't connect or be in this world and that one. I lost relationships. I became more and more isolated, more and more fragile. And so one day I decided in January of 1985 that I was going to stop this, that it was not giving me life as they had promised. In fact, it was taking my life and destroying me. And so one night I convened a, like a, um, a you, you would call it a seance, or for me it was meditation because I practiced an hour of meditation a day and a half hour of yoga and a half hour of meditation a day. And during a, the meditation, I told my uh, spirit guides that I no longer intended to channel and that I was going to leave this and get back into the mainstream, that I had become too isolated. And so I went to bed that night thinking that I was out of it, that I was going on with my life. And then here's what happened the next morning. The next morning was Saturday, errand day before rising. I snuggled under my down-filled comforter, pulled its salmon casing up under my chin and whispered, yes, this was a good decision. But then the entity whispered in low, menacing tones, couldn't leave, Sharon. Sorry. Have to stay. Nowhere to go. Sorry. And I thought to myself, no, this can't be. And then he started swearing and just filling my mind with evil, cursing and crude names and calling me names. And my insides were just trembling and the horror dawned that overnight my wise, caring counselor had shed his skin and a sadistic tormentor occupied my mind and body. And he said to me, you are mine to do with as I please. And he did. I was so shocked that the evil that I didn't believe in now possessed me. And all I could do was like go to a spiritual shelf and watch as this entity or being, I thought it was an angel, but it turned out to be a demon. I called him an evil spirit. Just tore up the insides of me. They controlled my mind. They controlled my emotions. They controlled and attacked my body. I had bruises. I was sick to my stomach. They kept me up all night long. And I was trying many things to try and get free of this possession. But, of course, there was no answer. I called all of the churches that I had attended in Denver. I called the Unity Church, the Spiritualist Church, the Mile High Church of Religious Science. And they told me that this was my karma, that I had to, they had to work this through. And then once I came through this, that like would attract like and I would be free again. And so I 
kind of tried various things to get free, but what I learned to do most was to deny them expression so that I could veto an impulse or I could veto a thought, I could veto an expression, and I could refuse to act on it is what I'm saying. But I couldn't originate a thought. I couldn't originate a feeling. I remembered how I used to be, and that's how I acted. Of course, I closed my practice, and then I just kind of existed. And I lived that way from January 85, and then around summertime of 85, um, one day I was ironing, and the um, something supernatural happened that pierced it, and I just heard this voice. And it was God saying, I exist. And I was flooded with relief that there was a being that was above all of this that was oppressing me. And I kept praying for the most superior spiritual force to come save me. And then God said, I exist. And that gave me hope. But I still didn't know what the bridge was between me and it, me and him. And so what I decided to do was to commit suicide. I decided that the only way out, the only way for me to get from here to God was to die. And so what I did was made plans to do this. But just as I was about ready to implement my plans, God lifted the demons for just long enough for me to realize that there was going to be a solution. And so I had hope that there was a solution. But then they came back again. And this was like August of 1985. It would be December of 1986 before I learned about Jesus. I wrote a friend of mine who had gone to college with, who I thought was a Zen Buddhist, and... I told her that I'd gotten trapped in the New Age and that there were some demons. I didn't know that. There were some evil spirits who were controlling my life and I couldn't get free. And unbeknownst to me, I thought she was a Zen Buddhist, but what she had just become a Christian. So what she did was she sent me the Bible. And in the Bible, she was a psychologist, so in the Bible she um, put little yellow sticky markers about at Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. And so when I read the Bible, I couldn't really read it because the demons were harassing my mind so badly I couldn't finish it. But she also sent me Joanna Michelson's book, The Beautiful Side of Evil. And the way that Joanna described her journey and what happened to her, I knew that she understood. And she got free by becoming a Christian. And I was just shocked that Christians believed in the supernatural. And so I thought, well, that's, there's hope. That's one way to God. And, but yet, then, then the demons let up for a while, and it wasn't quite so bad. I was able to sleep through the night. And then, of course, about March of 87 is when they um, really, really got bad again, and I was unable to sleep and think and, and do much else. And so finally... One night, I was crying and and reaching out to God and and saying, "Um, all right, I'll become a Christian. I'll become a Christian. That's all I said. And I felt this power just rise up in me, which only can be explained by God, rise up in me, giving me the strength to say, enough, I'll become a Christian. Well, I didn't know any Christians. And so I called my friend who lived in Burbank, California, and it happened that the pastor that was at her church in in Burbank was uh, used to be the pastor at Corona Presbyterian Church. And so she told me to call Corona Presbyterian Church and tell them that I was demon-possessed and wanted to know Jesus Christ. (laughs) Right. And she also told me to call the vineyard and also the Episcopal bishop, who at the time was Bishop Fry. And so I did all three of those. I called up Corona Presbyterian Church, and I said, I'm Sharon Thomas at the time. I'm Sharon Thomas. I'm demon-possessed, and I want to know Jesus Christ. (laughs) And so the um, 
bless her heart, you know, she was the secretary. <laughs> oh, that's just fine. You come on down. And so, <laughs> right. And, and the vineyard did the same, and I had an appointment with Bishop Fry, the same. It was just wonderful. But I couldn't get these appointments for another week, right? So that same day that I called the church, the churches, on Oprah Winfrey, she had a, a, a priest, a Catholic priest and a Lutheran pastor who were talking about demon possession. And so they were saying that you had to get to someone who knew something about possession. Okay, I did that. I flew up to Minneapolis where this pastor's church was that night. And I walked into his church the next morning, and I told him that I wanted to know Jesus Christ. And so he just led me up to the altar, and I accepted the Lord. (laughs) Flew home from Minneapolis. But where I was really freed, uh, really saved, was in Corona Presbyterian Church. While the pastor and the uh, woman prayed for me, um, and they had taught me the gospel, and they had also told me what I needed to say to become a Christian. I, I had said those words and confessed my need for Jesus. And um, as they were praying, the Holy Spirit came in and broke the hold of the demons, and I was freed. Praise God. Now, following that, as you might imagine, uh, maybe you don't imagine, that that the warfare was very intense for another four or five years. And it was a real battle for my mind and for my body. But it was, the battle was for me um, not significant because I had Jesus. About two weeks after I became a Christian, I was in a worship service and the Lord gave me the gift of the Holy Spirit and tongues. And so I felt the Spirit moving up in me and giving me power, which I really needed for the battle. And when I was praying and, and I received that gift, I knew that the Holy Spirit was more powerful because he had the power to drive out and to push away those demons that were tormenting my mind and also my body. And so I think that, that God gives those kinds of gifts to people that need them. Um, I would also say that when I was trying to get help, uh, a lot of people that were well-meaning Christians called up the demons and talked to the demons about what I needed to do to get rid of them, which is really not a good practice. And so I found myself confessing sins that the demons had identified, which is really not a good practice. But once I stopped that... And I realized that it's by faith, and faith in the one that's more powerful who would heal me. I realized that what I needed to do was just to lead a normal Christian life. I carried scriptures with me everywhere. Whenever they would attack my mind, I would use a scripture and say a prayer to battle, to make what we call the truth claim. And so I would say what was true to counter what they were saying. And then slowly I would become involved in the Christian world. I I got acquainted with people and started doing ministry. I started giving my testimony very soon after I became a Christian, mainly in Boulder. And then then, uh, then the, the demons just faded from my awareness. It wasn't immediate. They just faded from my awareness as I led what I call a normal Christian life through praise and worship and worshiping God and serving our Savior. I'll take some questions if you have them. I guess Mark. (laughs) Mark's been praying. (laughs) Working in the the ministry in Anchorage, we had members on the team that could see in the spiritual realm. Can you still see in the spiritual realm? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. Although I did ask God not to to work with me through the word rather than visions because of my background. I have a discernment uh, for evil that that it's not visionary. It's just a sense. Uh 
Uh-huh. Under that umbrella mm-hmm. um, how, how did you account for that later? Later? Um, I, here, uh, the only explanation I have, and it's a mystery that I purposely don't try and understand too much, but because I, I've often wondered how they could predict things in the future. The only explanation I have is that the, it were things that they intended to bring about. Lisa? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. A lot of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I have a sister who, who was into this. Actually, she didn't go into it on her own. There was this spirit that came. Yeah. And in our culture, people accept the spirit. Yeah. And they even do an initiation ceremony. Yeah. Where they even, they can drink blood without, mm-hmm. without even vomiting or anything. And uh, they did this to my sister when she was still young. Mm-hmm. And she grew up, she became a medium. Mm-hmm. And she was doing all kinds of things. And she was helping people. She can heal diseases. Right. She can do all kinds of stuff. Right. Can you but hear uh, him back there? He has a happened, sister who, has a, who is a medium. What happened is she came to a point where she wanted to become a Christian. Yeah. But uh, these spirits were so strong, strong and aggressive. Uh-huh. And I tried to help her to 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 leave this this workout mm-hmm. by saying she has to to deny the things because she had things like like clothes mm-hmm. that were used to when she is going into this spirit right. thing she would wear those clothes she would have she had all kinds of stuff. I know. I so what she did is I, I told her to ban those things. Right. But. Uh, she took them because she was afraid. She, she would always talk to the spirit. Mm-hmm. And then uh, she decided to take them and hide them in a cave. Mm-hmm. And then when she came back home, the spirits came on her. Mm-hmm. And she was told to go and get those things. Or else they were going to kill her children. Right. They were going to destroy all her property. Because they say they, they, they actually claimed everything that she had. Right. Including the husband. Right. And some of the children actually died. And she didn't go and take those things. So she had to go and get those things back. And and still there was no there was no peace. And I'm afraid she she even died before before she mm-hmm. before she left this world. He's describing how the spirits would threaten him, her his sister with killing those that she loved if they didn't obey in a certain way and that um, when she tried to break free that she would um, be so intimidated by these spirits that she would eventually capitulate and I can attest to that they would threaten me all the time with people that I loved that they were going to hurt them as they hurt me that if I didn't obey them that they were going to attack those I loved and I, I saw them do that too it's a very real, real um, threat and enemy that we have. Jeremy. Um, the the movie we talked about in our interview was um, Back to the Witch and a medium. And uh, like you, she said that she started having these habits very early on. And uh, part of what drove her away from the church was that the church she was involved in, which was a little girl, basically shunned her because of these things that there was a way yeah. to her. Um, how, what do you recommend for a church that where a child comes in and they're manifesting these types of behaviors? How, what, what kind of action does the church need to take to embrace and remedy the situation instead of driving them in? Well, children who are having, you know, seeing spirits or are having these kinds of manifestations need the same thing we do. You know, Jesus, and prayer, and praise and worship, and love, 
and good teaching about who Jesus really is. But their tendency is to deny the supernatural, both the evil, you know, and, and the power that comes with Christ. But I think that most children, if they're talking about seeing spirits and they're seeing them in such a way that they're talking, that they're having conversations, that they are independent of what, you know, their mind, then it needs to be taken seriously and, not, and to be advised not to talk to them. Just talk to Jesus. When, I, when kids come to me who are having trouble spiritually, seeing things in the night, ghosts are coming. I do get children who come to see me for help. I just say, talk to Jesus. Never dialogue with a spirit. Never talk to the dead. Never talk to animals. Never talk to anything that manifests. Only talk to Jesus. And then I just give them a scripture to pray. But t- take it seriously. I mean, it's real. And, they, and it's our children. Would you say, though, that, that it's also important to, to let the kids know that it's okay that they may see these things, not to be afraid of it as long as they have Jesus? That Jesus right. Is than yeah. Things? I convey that by who I am because they're just like, let's get rid of these things. <laughs> Jesus does that. Yeah. have any indication as to why these types of spirits would reveal themselves to certain people but not yeah. most people? I don't know. How they or what I don't know. I don't know why I saw them as a girl and others don't. My mother saw spirits also. My family actually was a Mormon. They were of the reorganized church of the Latter-day Saints. That's where they eventually ended up. And so they, my mother uh, fashioned herself to be some kind of a prophet. Um, I don't. I don't know. 